morning, everyone. Welcome to the first seminar of the third party day. It appears to be a tradition to put me in this place. Um, it's, um, uh, the, the seminar is about uh, embedded software development, and um, those of you um, who know me uh, might think, well, he's a hardware guy, how is he supposed to tell us something about software? And uh, the truth is, this seminar is not going to go into the nuts and bolts of software, but um, into how do you get to the device and uh, what, what is an embedded system anyway. Um, my name is Jens Schoenfeld. For, for those of you who are watching this uh, on, on the stream, my name is Jens Schoenfeld. I'm the CEO of uh, Individual Computers, and um, we develop uh, hardware, um, both uh, in contract and um, our own hardware. Um, and um, this uh, seminar uh, targets people who are interested in developing for systems that uh, wouldn't be considered to be scene compatible or uh, demo compatible because they don't have a monitor uh, to show effects and they, they don't have a keyboard to, to hack something into. And um, my target is to, um, to take away a fear of, of accessing such a device. And um, um, the example is uh, uh, the Nequesta residential gateway. Um, that's our router, and um, I want to kick this off with, uh, by, by uh, clearing up the question, what is a residential gateway anyway? And um, <clears throat> uh, some of you might just uh, think of it as, as a router. It provides your wide area network access, that means internet access, gets you to the outside world. Um, it's got a few switch ports, so you can connect more than just one computer and uh, it provides uh, wireless LAN access um, uh, as an access point, so as, as your host. Um, and um, uh, this particular one um, also has a PBX system. It lets you connect telephones and turn regular telephones into voice over IP telephones. And um, these telephones are uh, um, in a PBX system. PBX system means that uh, you can um, dial through different numbers, you are accessible through different numbers from the outside world, you can place internal calls without going through the external uh, network, and so on. That, that's what PBX system means, in German, Telefonanlage. Um, and then, of course, uh, we have another hardware um, uh, port, a USB port, popular port, of course. Uh, the uh, that port provides access to, for example, a hard drive that can be shared with all the computers that are in the system. Uh, so you can, for example, share your MP3 collection or share work uh, that you uh, do together with your colleagues. And um, you can also turn a regular printer into a network printer by just connecting it to this one and make it available to all the computers in the network. So uh, you, you can totally get rid of your print server, which probably consumes like 40, 50, 60 watts and uh, is, is, is always on and always idle waiting for print jobs. And um, yeah, so this, this thing shall be the center of your home network, home and maybe even small office network. Um, now if, if, the, uh, if the following few pages uh, have a little bit of a sales pitch, it doesn't mean that I want to sell the router to you. But essentially, I want to sell developing for the routers to you. So um, give me a few minutes to, to explain what, uh, what this thing is about and what, uh, uh, what it um, yeah, how, how the hardware is composed and uh, then how you get to it. So first of all, um, we have uh, um, we've designed the whole router to be modular. And one module is um, this one, the uh, ADSL2 Plus module, which is just plugged on top of the, uh, uh, on top of the main board. Um, it's a very f a small form factor, and it provides the, uh, the standard um, uh, ADSL2 Plus um, outside Germany, outside ISDN country. It means that uh, you can have downstreams of 24 megabits and upstreams of up to 3.5 megabits. Um, certain annexes allow different ratios, but uh, don't want to go into detail here. Um, it's a very low powered uh, um, and low noise design, therefore it performs very well on, on long distance lines. So uh, if, you live, if you live out in the country and you have trouble with your DSL modem, 
this modem and this module will probably have less trouble than, than, uh, than others. Um, some higher end would be um, a DOCSIS uh, module that provides uh, um, WAN access uh, for DOCSIS and EuroDOCSIS networks. Um, this one has uh, up to 43 megabits downstream, 35 megabits upstream. And um, this is a field proven design. It's been sold by my partner Castlenet in, uh, in Taiwan. Um, they, they've been selling this design for years and years and uh, um, their customers really have a lot of trust in, um, uh, in, in my partner uh, Castlenet because uh, especially cable networks are fairly delicate and therefore you need, you need to provide high quality. Now, um, DOCSIS 2 is, um, is an established standard. The current standard uh, would be DOCSIS 3. We are working on such a module as well, and that's also going to be just a plug-on module. Um, so everything is going to be in one box. Next one would be um, VDSL. That's the latest and greatest in DSL standards, and that provides up to 100 megabit downstream, 50 megabits upstream, but the real world is slightly different rates up a lot lower, um, depending on the, the, the length of the, uh, of the lines. VDSL is backwards compatible to ADSL2+, so if a provider um, is currently providing you with ADSL2 plus service, but uh, you are scheduled to be upgraded to VDSL, this would also be the way to go, because uh, it can also connect to an ADSL uh, DSLAM. Now, um, we're using a Broadcom chipset, which is known to be very compatible with all kinds of DSLAM makers. Um, those of you who are not familiar with the, with the term, DSLAM is just the other side of the, uh, of the DSL modem. Um, that's the uh, central office equipment, that's what it's called. Um, now, uh, if you want to go really modern, then the router can have an assembly option for an SFP module. SFP is um, a, a modular standard which has been used by many switch vendors. Um, uh, you, you find these SFP ports on HP Procurve switches, for example, and um, they provide point-to-point uh, -point access for, um, yeah, for general uh, switching. Um, you can buy modules that you can plug in there that have a reach of up to 200 kilometers. Um, not sure whether this has ever been proven, but uh, the uh, uh, the technical data just says that it, uh, this is available. The, the usual um, use case is that uh, a line of a few kilometers is, uh, uh, is being used and uh, uh, data is being transferred directly between a switch or some, some kind of access point uh, to a um, residential gateway or some other switch that uh, provides access. Um, this is a gigabit link. There are other SFP modules with higher speeds available, but uh, uh, the Nequesta Gateway provides a gigabit link. Now, the next thing is uh, providing wireless LAN. Wireless LAN is also modular with this, uh, with this thing. Modular uh, by means of uh, PCI Express, mini PCI uh, Express half cards. Um, you can find these cards in, uh, in laptops, for example. And um, you have a choice of the uh, Broadcom uh, 2.4 gigahertz or the dual band cards, 2.4 gigahertz and 5 gigahertz. Now, the reason why uh, practically everyone is moving away from 2.4 gigahertz these days is that uh, even if you, if you live in a crowded area and even if you have high quality equipment, the 2.4 gigahertz uh, band is just infested with lots and lots of uh, applications that are running in there. Uh, like, for example, wireless LAN, Bluetooth, DAC telephones, and then, of course, leaking microwaves. So 2.4 gigahertz is not the way to go anymore. Uh, not to mention the, uh, the number of cha uh, challen uh, channels that, uh, that can be used without interference. Um, the 2.4 gigahertz band only has, uh, well, let's say, three channels that can be used totally without interference because one channel also bleeds into another channel, and therefore you cannot use directly neighbor channels. This is totally different than the 5 gigahertz band. You got uh, uh, all the, those channels are totally free of interference, even if you uh, go for the, for the widest range, um, uh, for the widest channel range. Um, so uh, the, the big demand for 5 gigahertz uh, 
can be covered with this uh, with this router. So I, I bet every one of you has heard of uh, uh, this, this demand if you have an iPad or something at home or with you. Now, um, since we have the possibility to uh, put two cards in there, um, we can uh, we can open more SSIDs, we can have um, more performance, basically. So 600 megabit routers um, use practically uh, always the, uh, the, um, the same technique. We have the proprietary Broadcom drivers, um, but we are using the open source access point software host APD. We're still in the process of porting. Not completely done yet, but we're on it. And um, uh, you can... Um, of course, since it's open source, uh, if you want, you can hack into it. Now, um, next thing, uh, the, uh, the local Ethernet ports. Um, I also wanted to have this uh, a little bit higher than the standard because current standard still appears to be 100 megabit. The current makers of, of routers uh, appear to be saying, OK, our WAN access is still below 100 megabit, and therefore, we choose 100 megabit for our local switch. But in my opinion, that's not the way to go, because if you want to uh, build your own internal network and if you want to access, for example, your hard drive or access data from other computers, then you want to talk at higher speeds. So um, I wanted to have gigabit in there. And uh, um, of course, a gigabit switch that has the capacity to switch at line rate between these computers. And that's why the five gigabit backbone inside the switch is so important. Um, these ports are backwards compatible, so if you have a 100 megabit or even a 10 megabit uh, uh, connection, you just plug it in and it works. I mean, that goes without saying. Um, the, uh, the switch supports jumbo frames, just over 9K uh, per frame. Um, not sure who's, uh, who's using that, but we support it. Um, uh, auto crossover, that means whatever cable you have, if it's a straight or a crossover cable, the switch is going to recognize it. And uh, auto polarity, so even if you have uh, some wiring in your house where some, uh, some lines are swapped, it's also going to uh, correct that. Auto negotiation means it, uh, it tries to establish the fastest possible, and so on. Um, now, VLAN tagging, single double tagging, means that uh, if, if you want to build uh, different, um, different parts of your network, um, then the switch is going to help you take load off of the CPU and separate networks, for example, into a guest network and a home network where your uh, security is slightly lower, it's so, some kind of demilitarized zone. So it's a fully managed switch. Uh, that means uh, you got quite a few more possibilities than, than just a normal off-the-shelf switch. Now, um, the PBX system part is uh, probably the most interesting because these days the, um, uh, uh, the, the telephone companies and the uh, internet companies, they, they are trying to switch off their public switch telephone networks because they are too expensive to operate. They are trying to move everything to voice over IP and Nequesta shall help in doing that. It provides um, an ISDN uh, or up to two ISDN ports. That means independent ISDN ports, so you can uh, have two active S0 buses, meaning you can place four calls at the same time. Um, and uh, we got two independent analog telephone uh, chipsets. That means you can connect another two analog telephones, for example, fax machines or your favorite wireless phone that uh, still works on, on the analog standard. And um, the, uh, the PBX system behind it, the PBX software, is the popular asterisk. Um, asterisk is, uh, has been developed for years and years, um, and uh, this, this has been the de facto standard in, uh, in PBX system uh, software, and we're also using that. Um, now, the uh, ISDN part, is, uh, is based on, or it's not based on, it is um, uh, Jolly's uh, LCR. LCR stands for Linux Call Router. And this one also has the, uh, the interface to the asterisk um, uh, PBX system. So that, that's how we get, uh, that, that's how we marry these ISDN and analog telephone parts with the voice over IP world. Um, that means asterisk uh, is, is providing this, this access. Now, um, the, uh, the board itself, the Nequesta board, has assembly options to reduce the number of ports. So I can, I can take away, for example, one of the ISDN to reduce cost, 
And I can even take away one of the analog telephone uh, uh, ports to reduce cost. And this is all for uh, providers who just um, want to have the router as um, your basic access thing um, if you sign your usual two-year contract with them and uh, get this box for free or whatever. Um, now, um, with the USB port, there comes a totally new um, world of um, possibilities. We've got uh, support for a USB hard drive, for example, which you can share through a Samba share. So whatever uh, operating system you have, be it Windows or Macintosh or uh, uh, Linux, uh, they can all share uh, this, this data on, on the hard drive through the network. And um, it's, it's a USB 2.0 high speed, uh, so it's not the latest and greatest, but still fast enough to uh, um, uh, sufficiently provide uh, speed, uh, speeds that allow you to copy your MP3 collection back and forth without waiting forever. Now, um, I also mentioned the printer before. The printer um, is something that should support the uh, internet printing protocol, the IPP. And um, there's also the possibility to connect your UMTS surf stick to this one. Um, if you have uh, experienced some DSL failure before and uh, you've used such a stick on your laptop, then uh, you might know that it's a little inconvenient. You always have to start some special software on the laptop and you're always connected directly to the net, but all your other computers are not connected. And, Therefore, it's, it's really a, a huge advantage if you can connect your USB surf stick to this one and use it as a WAN backup. Or if you live outside uh, somewhere uh, in, uh, in the country where DSL or cable service is not available at all, you can use it as your main WAN access and um, just have it as, um, as your main router. Some areas uh, have that, uh, uh, have 3G available, but they do not have ADSL available. And um, yeah, um, now the router itself, the router itself consists of, uh, or the core of the router is made of a uh, um, fairly powerful processor. Uh, some of you might consider a 600 megahertz processor uh, not exactly powerful because uh, your dual core machines are so much more powerful. But uh, just consider this. I mean, the, the machine is always on, always online. And not too long ago, a 600 megahertz computer was our main system. And uh, 128 megabytes RAM are uh, also not exactly small. So, and especially the speed of the, uh, the, of the DDR2 memory is something that exceeds the speeds of uh, those 600 megahertz computers that we had a little over 10 years ago. Um, I have calculated the memory performance to be around 2.6 gigabytes per second. So uh, whatever kind of data you, uh, you're moving around, you don't exactly have to wait for it. Um, the whole system starts from a four megabyte serial boot flash and uh, after the Linux kernel has been started, um, a 128 megabytes NAND flash um, becomes available. And um, we've made this, or well, together with Broadcom, we made the decision to, uh, to go for uh, Linux, Linux kernel 2627.18. And uh, that was a conservative decision, which, is, uh, which has always been made in the embedded world. Uh, take an old kernel, take something that is stable, uh, something that is known to work, where the interfaces don't change every day, and so on. So um, if this looks old, for the embedded world, a 2.6.27.18, 2.6 kernel in general, is the de facto standard. You don't find a 3 kernel um, on an embedded system, at least not on, on those systems that are out in the field with uh, uh, high quantities in the field. So, um, and, and here's something that is substantially different from developing for a, uh, for a desktop system. You always have to keep in the back of your head that this, uh, this thing is always on, always online, and you hardly have any interface to get to it. So your main target is to keep the machine as stable as possible. If you, uh, uh, whatever choices you make for the desktop computer, you probably um, make the choices for higher performance or fancier design and whatnot. Um, but in the embedded world, um, if you have a choice between fancy high performance and conservative known to work, 
you always go for the conservative part because this, uh, this thing might stand in, I don't know, your, your mom's home and it's, it's the main internet and telephone access. There is no normal telephone access available. And if you want to place an emergency call, you can't just restart the machine uh, just to uh, get it working again. So you have to rely on it to, um, to stand up times of several months, even years. So a crash is totally out of the question. You can't do that. Uh, and that's why um, these conservative decisions are being made in the, uh, in the embedded world. Um, last point, the bootloader. The bootloader uh, CFE. CFE stands for Common Firmware Environment. That's, uh, that's a fairly powerful bootloader. Um, of course, there, there are fancier things. Uh, we talked about it previously. Um, uh, but uh, CFE um, does some basic initializing of the hardware and it gives you access through shell. Um, it can load U-boot images, for example. And um, that's, uh, that's also something uh, that has been provided by, by the chipset vendor, by Broadcom. Um, now, let me show you just one aspect of the, um, uh, of the router itself. Um, Many of you know that uh, if you get a DSL router, it is just a DSL router. So um, if, if you want to turn that DSL router into something else, so for example, an IP router, or use it as your general wireless access point, then um, you have quite some hurdles to go. And um, our router is uh, geared to, to be very universal. So if you know what you're doing and you want to uh, change it to, uh, from being an IP router into uh, a PPPoE router, uh, then it's just a choice out of many. And um, one choice, for example, uh, one choice here I, I want to pick out and uh, sell that to you as uh, the cool feature would be uh, the failover mo uh, mode. Um, failover means uh, you can define up to three different connections, three different uh, wide area network connections that um, have a different priority. So uh, let's call your primary internet connection, maybe your DSL connection at home, and uh, your secondary uh, internet connection would be um, the uh, USB UMTS stick. Um, so, uh, and your third, maybe, I don't know, maybe you have a line to some, some other DSL modem that uh, gives you access through PPPoE. You can define, up, like I said, up to three and the router is going to try to connect to the internet uh, at the highest possible rate. Um, so primary, if the primary internet connection works, the other two are down and um, the, uh, uh, everything works as you would expect. But on those one or two days of the year where the, uh, where the line fails, or in some other countries it might be up to 10 days a year where the, uh, where the line fails, um, you're practically screwed. You always you, you would have to uh, spend an hour or two to get your basic working machine back online, and uh, that's that's a workload that the router can take off of you. So you just plug in the uh, um, the UMTS stick, uh, give it the access data, and whenever the DSL line fails, the uh, uh, the router can switch to the other line, to the backup line, and provide access, maybe at lower speeds, but still provide internet access fast enough to, to check your email and uh, to continue working, maybe to uh, administer your, uh, your servers, because um, an SSH connection doesn't require that much, um, uh, that much bandwidth. And um, while the backup connection is up and running, the router tr uh, probes the, the higher prioritized um, connections in the background. And uh, whenever that's available again, it's being switched back. Of course, you, uh, you get a new IP address. So it's, um, it is kind of never offline again. But, um, well, you might have heard this from some other company. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> no live bubbling yet? <clears throat> And um, no, line bundling is something that uh, we don't want to go for because this is, uh, this is a residential gateway. This is uh, for home and small offices. And um, if, you, if you bundle lines, then uh, you, um, uh, you increase cost by far. And uh, what I wanted uh, to offer here is uh, 
uh, increase functionality and um, not higher speeds or something. Um, that would be totally out of the scope of developing this router. But um, I think this is a distinctive feature. I think no other router has this kind of feature, um, this, this easy to configure. And um, uh, this is the kind of features that, that I want to put in there. And um, I want to end the, uh, the, the sales pitch here. Um, I just wanted to show you that, well, there is a possibility to make something boring like a router a little bit cooler than, than, other, um, than other vendors. So, um, so let's, let's get into the thing. How do you get to it? Because if, uh, if you don't have a keyboard, you don't have a monitor, and um, you uh, are trying to connect to the thing with, uh, with SSH, but nothing is answering, then uh, you're practically locked out. But um, I mean, of course, being locked out out of the system that is your window to the outside world is a good thing because it's, it's a security feature. But you want to develop for this, and you need to unlock this, uh, this thing somehow. And the secret is a console. It's the old RS-232 standard, uh, sometimes in Germany called V24 standard. Um, it's been established sometime in the 70s, and um, it's still alive today. Um, uh, what I've done, maybe a little bit different from other vendors, is that I've uh, written the uh, uh, the size, uh, um, uh, not not the size. I've uh, written the speed and and the, the baud rates and everything. I've written that on the board. I'm using the same pinout as um, most other vendors. So um, if you already have a serial cable, it's very likely to work on Equestor as well. So, um, but if you want to make one. Uh, it's also fairly easy to hack um, because uh, most of the mobile phones uh, back then, uh, when, when communication cables uh, were state-of-the-art and when, when everybody wanted to transfer uh, ringtones to their telephone, to their uh, Siemens or Nokia telephone, um, these communication cables were basically USB to serial just without the 12-volt uh, level converters. So um, you can just hack these cables into a serial cable um, uh, to, to access an embedded system like this. Um, but um, sooner or later, we are going to offer these serial cables ready-made uh, from USB to this pin header inside of the box. Um, so you don't have to hack at all. Like I said, um, I'm more of a hardware guy. It's, it's not a problem for me to, to do soldering, but I, under, uh, I understand that uh, many of you uh, are a lot better on the keyboard than on a soldering iron. And um, that's, that's why my interest is, of course, in providing easy access to the box. Um, now, the, uh, when the system is starting, you... Um, you can only watch things happen within a few seconds and uh, uh, on the console. Um, but uh, in order to understand um, what, what's going on, you really you, you have to to separate how the uh, the whole system is starting. The CPU itself, um, when it starts up, it loads its uh, its bootloader from um, from a NOR flash, from a serial flash. Um, uh, the serial flash has the uh, unique property, as opposed to a NAND flash that uh, every single bit is guaranteed to be working and therefore um, no error correction or error detection, error correction algorithm is required in order to launch the system. You can just transfer the data from flash into memory and execute it there. Um, of course, since these guaranteed to be good flash chips are more expensive than NAND flash, um, uh, we've chosen a small one, a four megabyte flash, and uh, the bootloader is only 512K of, uh, of that. Um, now, the bootloader um, is controlled by environment variables, and uh, one of these environment variables is the startup variable that uh, tells the bootloader to uh, get the kernel and an initial RAM image from uh, also from the serial flash because uh, the bootloader doesn't doesn't do error correction and it doesn't have uh, a NAND driver. Um, and once the the Linux kernel is running, um, it uh, it can start the NAND driver with all the error correction and crunching algorithms and all that fancy stuff. It's it's blazingly fast. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. The uh, 
um, all this error correction and, and packing and, and, and that is, is so fast that uh, it's, it, it beats the performance of, uh, of, of certain hard drives. <coughs> And uh, of course, the NAND flash is a lot bigger. That's where the, the main applications come from. And um, now, in order to, to hack into this, um, in order to, to get it working, um, to, to really start up from scratch, there is some hardware stuff involved. Um, you can program uh, these chips in a programmer. And uh, I've titled it Programming It the Hard Way because um, the turnaround times of uh, unsoldering the chip, uh, cleaning it up and uh, uh, aligning the pins and putting that into a, a zero and search and for socket, programming the binary, then soldering it back on, or maybe even soldering another of these uh, zero and search and for sockets onto the board, that's a very tedious process. And um, you can, if, if you have some practice, then the turnaround times for a reflash like this they are in the 30 to 40 minutes range, and that's not exactly the turnaround time that you're looking for if you want to have a, a smooth development process. So um, these fine pitch um, uh, flash chips, uh, they're really a pain to, uh, uh, to unsolder, reprogram externally, and so on. Um, the serial flash is a little bit easier because it has fewer pins, it has a higher uh, pin pitch. I mean, the, this, this previous one, this has half a millimeter from pin to pin. And uh, you, you, I mean, my eyesight is not that perfect anymore. I do need a microscope to do that, and probably everyone else uh, requires that as well. Um, but uh, the serial flash chips, they have 1.27 millimeters from pin to pin, and it's only eight pins. Um, so these are a lot easier to do. Um, so once, once you have really separated between uh, serial and NAND flash, and uh, not working with, with those large NOR flashes anymore, um, it, it's getting easier. Um, so you can, you can start developing for the machine um, and just get the serial console working. And, um, uh, now, if the processor is something known, um, uh, okay, uh, there, there's another uh, possibility to program the flash. Um, because once you've got the, uh, the CFE, the bootloader, working, and once you have something on the console, you can use um, uh, the property of uh, CFE to, to reprogram itself. And CFE even allows transferring that new flash image through serial. Um, there is, of course, a drawback to this because, um, uh, as you might know, um, uh, serial links, they, they are not perfect. If you remember the, the modem days, um, then you have been transferring uh, files through uh, Z modem or a Kermit pr uh, protocol. And all this is not uh, in, in CFE. I mean, they just rely on the bytes being transferred properly. And the only, the only error detection um, that there is is just the number of bytes. So if the number of bytes that, are, that is expected is, is, not, uh, is not arriving, then CFE gives an error. But uh, anything on top of that just doesn't work. So um, it is likely to fail, and therefore it's not exactly the preferred method. Um, the preferred method, if uh, the unit is totally bricked, is JTAG. Um, JTAG is, uh, is a standardized interface that many processors have, and um, it's, uh, it's in-system programming. It gives you, it frees you from uh, having to solder on the board and removing chips and having special uh, programming equipment. Um, uh, but there is one drawback. There are not very many vendors for JTAG equipment. The market leader is Lauterbach, and uh, Lauterbach is really, really expensive. I'm not saying this, that this is a bad thing. Lauterbach does great equipment, but uh, it is really too expensive for the hobbyist. And um, if you want to, to be certain that you want to uh, be able to debrick your unit if you, uh, if you are messing around with the bootloader, then you need something cheaper. And uh, to, uh, to have that kind of security in, in, in the back of your head, um, you need um, something that is, uh, that, that, that is slightly more affordable. Now, USBJTech.com. Uh, he's uh, th this guy is uh, is doing it uh, is doing this design 
practically in his spare time. He has a day job, also in the computer business, but um, he's, uh, he's very interested in uh, um, embedded systems and he has developed um, this uh, little JTAG, USB JTAG adapter. I mean, it, it's really tiny and that is something that's available for under $100. I think, um, I think it's, it's, it's even uh, somewhere in the vicinity of uh, $60, $70. So it, it's really affordable also to a hobbyist. And um, the, um, uh, now J, uh, the JTAG protocol allows um, certain, different, uh, um, certain different methods of uh, getting into the machine. It can be either very, very low level um, to, to, say, to tell the, the main chip reset, get offline, and let me wiggle all the, uh, all the, the, the pins. That's the, uh, the, the very basic method. It's, uh, you could consider this to be um, a kind of assembler programming. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the basic method if the CPU is not running at all. But uh, JTAG also allows uh, running the CPU and uploading code into the CPU. Um, and uh, that's what uh, th this guy, um, uh, usbjtech.com, what, what he's doing. Um, he lets the CPU run, he uploads a little program, and uh, he sets registers and makes use of the hardware inside of, this, uh, of the chip. And um, the programming times uh, that he's reaching, they are uh, really astonishing. It's uh, somewhere uh, around 300K a second. And uh, that's, that really reduces um, the programming times. I mean, I was talking about 30 to 40 minutes turnaround time uh, for exchanging the, uh, uh, the chips and reprogramming them, programming them, and always with, with the danger of, uh, of, of destroying the chips. Now, this danger is gone, and the programming times are going down to just a few seconds. And that really speeds up your development process in a way that uh, you can try something out, program it right away, and uh, uh, let it run, see if it works. And then that's, that's really getting you back into the, uh, uh, in, into the habit of uh, what, what you probably acquired on a desktop system. So just hit compile, hit run, and see what it does. And um, JTAG really gives you that opportunity on an embedded system. So Whenever JTAG is available, whenever you have a processor that is known enough, not too new, um, so JTAG is available, that should be your preferred method if network isn't available. Because um, network is, is another possibility. If you have the, um, the bootloader running already, and if you have ported all your hardware drivers, uh, so CFE uh, also has access to the network ports then you shouldn't be messing with, uh, with JTAG anymore because uh, a running system can always program itself a lot better than, um, uh, than, than any JTAG or serial access would do. Serial access uh, would still be necessary to pass commands into the system and to have your window, your keyboard and monitor into the system. But if you want to transfer higher amounts of data, then network is, uh, should be your preferred method. CFE supports the TFTP protocol. TFTP um, is uh, really a tiny protocol. There are open source uh, TFTP servers available for all kinds of operating systems, even for Windows. <laughs> and um, uh, that, uh, that's also very easy to set up. I've, uh, I've compiled some instruction files, uh, some PDF files. There are just a few pages. And in order to fill those pages, I even had, had to make a lot of screenshots. So it, that's, that's uh, really easy to set up and uh, uh, get to a working state. Um, and uh, like I said, once you got the networking drivers running, then uh, this should be a preferred method because, hey, you got a gigabit link. Can't get any faster than that, at least not on this kind of hardware. <coughs> and um, now, uh, booting Linux, um, from your development system um, or in a, during a development process uh, would mean that um, whenever you do a change, you would have to write things into your flash and, um, and then somehow reset the machine, restart the machine. And that is also 
uh, that's also a tedious process. I mean, how do you get into the, th into the thing? Of course, you got a console, you got a command line, and uh, you could exchange certain files, um, maybe set up a server or something. But um, those turnaround times when uh, uh, if, if you still have to, to go through the flash of the actual machine, um, that's still fairly slow. So your main target would be to, um, to use the, uh, the capacity of the machine that you're working on, of the, your cross-compiling machine. Maybe I should mention this uh, beforehand because um, uh, if you haven't developed for an embedded system before, if you have only developed on, on a desktop com a computer before, you are probably used to, um, uh, to, to having your uh, compiler and, uh, uh, some, uh, and uh, the whole development environment on that same machine that you developed for. So your development machine is identical with your target machine. And um, that is substantially different in the embedded world um, because uh, it is hardly ever um, the, the case that uh, you have a compiler on the target machine. The key word here is cross-compiling. So uh, you set up your, uh, your development system on some host computer the fastest that you can find uh, because compile times are always uh, uh, fairly high and if you have a huge project you can easily reach 20, 30 minutes compile times and every single minute compile time uh, saved is really saved money because uh, if, if you manage to do one or two more compiles per day then uh, you really increase your productivity and you don't want to compile on a 600 megahertz machine. So um, you're, uh, you want to do, um, uh, you want to work on the best dual quad core, whatever you have, and, and then transport that stuff over to the target machine and try it out there. However, if you go through flash, and if you always have a flash procedure in the middle before you can try that out, um, you always have something, some hurdle to go, and, and uh, this is something that uh, you want to eliminate to reduce turnaround times because, um, uh, yeah, reducing turnaround times means higher productivity, means less cost. There is a question. Uh, uh, just a second, there's a microphone, so you, uh, your question is also recorded. Um, are there any emulators available for, um, so to, to, in order to do some uh, pre-production on a desktop machine before you start this, uh, before you start trying out things on the hardware? Um, there are no emulators available. Um, so this is, this is not like uh, a development for a Commodore 64 or for, a, uh, for an Amiga where emulators are available. Um, uh, but um, it is, uh, um, like I said, we, uh, we've made uh, very conservative decisions. So if you are compiling open source software, if you are porting open source software, that has been running on an x86 system before, and if you are now porting that over to a MIPS system, um, one of the decisions we made was to let the MIPS processor also run in little endian mode. So, for example, you, you don't have any endian as problems. Um, you might know that these embedded processors like MIPS and ARM, they can be run in big endian mode and little endian mode, and some of them can even be switched on the fly, but um, uh, in, in order to, uh, to really to, to get around those kind of problems, um, we've made the decision to have uh, the, the whole machine run in little Indian mode. Um, the, uh, but uh, in, in order to, to speed things up, in order to see if something works at all, um, like I said, you want, it, you want to eliminate the flash and not really transfer things over to the machine and try them out there. Um, but to have the machine access the data that is inside of your host machine. So the, um, uh, uh, the CFE bootloader, um, like I said before, it, also, it already supports the TFTP protocol. So uh, instead of loading the Linux kernel from Flash, you can tell CFE to get its Linux kernel from the TFTP server. So. You, uh, you launch the machine, and the only thing that is getting from Flash is the, um, uh, the bootloader itself. It cannot load the bootloader from network, but once the bootloader is running, it can access the network. So if you have your network connection to your host computer and you have a TFTP server running there, 
um, then the TFTP server can always provide the latest image. And um, so if you start up the machine, it gets the latest image right through network without uh, having to transfer anything to the flash uh, before. And um, that, uh, this is, this is uh, just controlled through an environment var variable on, um, uh, uh, on the CFE command line. These environment variables are stored in flash and uh, therefore they, they can be persisted. So if you switch off and on again, then the environment variables are still there. Question? So it's somewhat like PXE boot. I haven't heard that before, and um, I, don't, I can't go into, uh, uh, into that. Sorry. Um, now, these environment variables, um, I mean, environment variables are something that, uh, um, that I, that's used in, in many operating systems. Um, even the Amiga has environment variables, and um, uh, it, it's also in, uh, uh, in Linux, of course. And these, um, these environment variables are being used to, to transfer uh, small pieces of, of information, even between the bootloader and the Linux kernel. So if you, um, you want to pass some kind of information some, uh, uh, between the bootloader and the Linux kernel, then you can store that kind of information in the environment variables because they are available under CFE. And later on, when the Linux kernel is started, um, these environment variables are also available. So um, uh, the, uh, the Linux kernel can also talk back to CFE if it, uh, if it is restarting itself. And it, uh, it also works the other direction. The uh, um, CFE bootloader can tell Linux uh, that it is being run from some different, uh, uh, from some different source, um, can, uh, for example, adapt the, the MAC address, uh, the, the IP address is uh, in your local network. Um, but yeah, that, that's something, um, yeah, I'm gonna get to that later. Um, now, the third step um, of mounting the NAND flash can also be eliminated in the development process. Like I said, if you want to, um, uh, if, if you want to develop, you want to, you want to do that fast. And always writing into the flash, again, it kills time. It uses up uh, flash cycles because these, these flash chips aren't forever. And in a huge project like this, you can easily get to a few hundred, even a few thousand compiles. And you really don't want to flash every time. So, um, now that you're under Linux, now that all this, uh, uh, all this software is working, um, you can not only mount a flash, um, but uh, you can make use of the hard drive in your host computer. Um, and the, the keyword here would be NFS, Network Filing System. Um, your, uh, uh, your device, your, your um, main computer, your development computer, would uh, not only act as a compiler and as a development environment, but it would also act as an NFS server. So whatever you compile, you would copy over to a directory that is exported through NFS, and um, your main system, your, your target system, would boot off of that. So the, um, if you compile, your files are on a hard drive, and this hard drive is being made available through network to your target system. And uh, by, by having this kind of setup, loading the kernel from TFTP and loading the application through NFS, you have totally eliminated the flash, and you've created a symbiosis, sim symbiosis, is that the, well, well, you know what I mean. <laughs> Um, uh, of, of two systems that, uh, that, that share resources and um, what previously was a black box to you has now become something that has a keyboard, uh, a monitor, and uh, you have a compiler and you even have some kind of hard drive where your, uh, where your system can access um, the, uh, the files that you have just compiled. You, are, you have no need to transfer things anymore. It's, it's really like you compile and you hit reset and the, uh, the thing is starting it. Sometimes you don't even have to, have to hit reset. You just send um, some, some signal to relaunch an application that, uh, that you have just recompiled and then you can try it out. And um, by, by applying all these, uh, uh, all these little tweaks to your, uh, to your setup, you have really reduced your, um, 
uh, your turnaround times from sometimes from hours down to seconds, um, depending on what what kind of uh, uh, project size you're compiling, and um, still, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work to do, and one one thing that uh, that I have tried to emphasize in the beginning uh, is that uh, we have a lot of open source software in the Nequesta router. Now, open source really, I mean, uh, especially the GPL requires us to um, to publish sources. Whatever changes we do, we have to give uh, give back to the uh, open source community. And uh, that is something that some companies have been violating frequently in the past. We're not that kind. For open, open source wise, we're on the good side. And uh, that is not just a phrase, um, because uh, some, some of those companies, they just wrap a big tar ball and say, well, here's it, here's the source, and that's, that's uh, uh, what, what the obligation is. You just open up the sources. But I think just opening up by sending out a tarball is, uh, it's like, yeah, dumping something on somebody else and, uh, well, silence him. That's not the way I feel about, uh, the, uh, about open sourcing and, and about uh, sharing um, the, uh, the results of your work. I mean, we have saved literally years, maybe even decades of, uh, um, of development by making use of open source software like, uh, like Linux, like the Asterisk system, the LCR, Linux, Linux call router. Um, we wouldn't have been able to provide ISDN services that quick um, within just a few months of development time if it wasn't for open source software. And um, I think um, by uh, uh, using that, uh, that software and by creating a whole new product um, with a combination of open source things, um, we, can, we can only uh, give that back to, to the community if uh, we wrap that all in, in a development virtual machine that contains everything that you require to develop for this thing. That means um, it's a VMware image um, and it must be VMware. It doesn't work on VirtualBox, don't ask me why. Um, it contains all the open source parts. It has the compiler and uh, it also um, has the, uh, the TFTP server and the NFS server in order to connect to, your, uh, to, the, to the host machine. And um, it's basically uh, run the virtual machine, connect to the target system with a, with a serial port, set some environment variables according to the, to the documentation that we, uh, that we publish and then um, you're ready to go. Then you have all that set up that, that I've just described at home, even without setting up a separate machine. That's what virtual images uh, are for. And um, even if you haven't done this before, you can set up a, uh, a development system like that within half an hour. And that's what I think should open source be about. I mean, involve everyone and give everyone a possibility to um, uh, to use um, this, this this kind of uh, development process. Now, what can you do? I've tried to make this thing um, most uh, most most appealing to the scene because um, I think there are so many routers out there that um, uh, well they somehow serve their purpose, but there is always something that you want to add. Um, one thing, one outstanding feature of our uh, of our web management uh, 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 surface there is the um, uh, is our language concept. Anything that is related to language is located in a single file that is uh, just just a Unicode file, and uh, whatever language you want to translate this to, you just take that file as one one source file of the language that you speak and. Uh, copy that uh, to the uh, to the next language you want to have. For example, you take the English one, uh, create a new one called I don't know Swedish, Danish, whatever. Um, you just edit all those strings, save it, and then you have translated the whole thing. Um, of course, the idea isn't new. Um, the uh, uh, the the idea of catalogs is uh, kind of stolen from the uh, from the Amiga system. At least that's where I got to know it. I think it's it's also being used in other 
uh, in other systems. But um, this, is, this is a way uh, to, to provide um, languages or uh, many different languages on, uh, uh, on such a system that is usually um, only available in English or, I don't know, Chinese English, uh, whatever. Now, SDL, simple direct layer, that's something um, you might wonder about because uh, simple direct layer uh, is more like media uh, related. The reason I'm asking for this is, um, yeah, well, we have a PBX system. And for example, if you transfer a call from one line to another, then uh, people usually get a waiting music. And all these waiting musics in PBX systems, they're all the same. We're seniors. Um, and we know the type of music that runs forever and ever. I mean, ultimately, I want to have a PBX system where I can drop in a SID file and use that as my waiting music in the PBX system. <laughs> and I think SDL would be uh, the way to, uh, to do that. Um, uh, asterisk is really a powerful PBX system. You can, uh, you can create call, um, uh, call plans and then have uh, uh, people uh, who are calling you, um, they, they can choose certain things with, um, uh, with their DTMF tones and stuff like that. I mean, there's, the possibilities are endless, and I really don't want to go into detail here, but um, I mean, now that you have a possibility to get into the system, if you are already an asterisk expert, this would be the, uh, uh, your target. And then, of course, we're talking about a system, a, a computer that has lots of memory, it has lots of spare computation power, it's always on and it's always online, it has storage. I mean, there is a multitude of applications that you can run on this. One of them might be some, uh, uh, some file sharing services, some, uh, for example, a, a torrent client, maybe some local game servers. That's what we were talking about yesterday, but just don't port Java to this. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I, I bet you guys have lots and lots of ideas for, for a system like this. And um, uh, now uh, the question that I got frequently also yesterday and the day before yesterday was, well, when is it going to be available? We've been working on this for uh, about two and a half years now, and we are in the process of making the pilot production run. We are uh, already in generation five of the hardware revision, and that already runs rock solid. So from a hardware point of view, we are rock solid. From a router point of view, we are rock solid. I mean, it's, it is ready to be shipped out to developers because uh, it is very unlikely that we're going to do any tweaks to that. The pilot production run is, uh, is just due in the next few weeks, and this pilot production run is going to be a few hundred units only. Um, and these few hundred units will be sold at a subsidized price, at a really low price uh, to, uh, to developers. If you're interested, just approach me after the seminar and um, Give me, uh, give me your address if you have a card or whatever. Uh, just, just leave it with me and I'm gonna make sure that you get a, a, such a board at a subsidized price and with the equipment that you require. For example, the serial access cable and uh, VDSL, ADSL, cable modem, whatever you require to, to operate this thing in your home. And um, now, yeah, ultimately I'm hoping with your help, um, uh, that, that we can establish that. Uh, I have put this into the presentation really late because uh, the, the development team has, uh, has provided another possibility to get into the box and that is uh, uh, the environment variable hack access. So uh, if you don't want to do all this setup with uh, environment variables and uh, booting from TFTP and whatnot, um, you can open a separate Samba share um, inside the box where you can replace um, any part of the web management and uh, all the, the scripts that we run in order to create the web surface. The, uh, all these scripts are in Lua. Um, so that's another possibility to get into. That's really fresh, that's new, and um, I'm not exactly familiar with it, so don't ask me too many questions about it. Um, but uh, in the end, uh, with your help, I want to create a router that doesn't suck. And um, I'm hoping that uh, you guys um, have had an insight into, um, 
uh, getting to such an embedded device, and I'm hoping that you have lots and lots of ideas to, uh, uh, to get into this thing and to create a momentum for um, something that uh, um, could be the scene router. That's what I'm hoping for. Okay, um, that's it from my side. Are there any questions? Silence. Okay, I already got the signal that I'm a little overdue. Thanks for your time. <laughs>